With me today are Peter Cooper and Bonnie Madak from the National Center for Biotechnology Information, or the NCBI. Peter and Bonnie have over 20 years of experience working with NCBI resources, both, both as scientists and information professionals. They've previously joined us for our webinar about the NCBI Gene Database, as well as the webinar, What is Bioinformatics Librarianship? And both of these webinars are available on the NNLM website if you missed them the first time. We are excited to host them once more for an overview of the NCBI Nucleotide Database. Peter, Bonnie, thank you for joining us again, and welcome. Thanks. Thank you, Molly. This is Bonnie, and I will be starting the webinar our plan today is to focus on, as Molly said, the nucleotide resource. I'll be giving an introduction or a recap. Peter will do a live web demonstration, and then I'll come back for the wrap-up. We've organized the webinar to show you how to answer these five questions. The questions overlap a little, and we'll be using the same record in some cases to answer more than one of these questions. I'm going to give a quick biology review, and that is DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, contains the information that is inherited and copied when cells multiply. It contains four nucleotide bases, A, T, C, and G, for which the full names are shown on the slide. A second biologically important molecule is RNA, or ribonucleic acid. One difference between DNA and RNA is that uracil replaces thymine, which is present in DNA. In the cell, many types of RNA exist. There's messenger RNA, there's ribosomal RNA, and there's also transfer RNA, just as a few examples. Through the process of transcription, a messenger RNA or mRNA molecule is made from the DNA strand. The mRNA is further translated into protein, specifically from the coding region part of the mRNA molecule. The coding region <laughs> begins with the start codon, which is shown here in the lower part of the slide and ends with a stop codon. Researchers need to know where the coding region, or the CDS, is in order to do their experiments, if they want to manipulate the coding region or do other determinations, and they want to know what the protein product is from a gene. In eukaryotes, or more highly developed organisms than bacteria, the genome DNA can be transcribed into more than one mRNA molecule, which can then result in more than one protein product from the gene. And you will sometimes see this on a nucleotide database record. The last biological concept in this quick review is that the organization of genomic DNA can be complex. There can be multiple chromosomes, multiple subcellular organelles with their own genomes, or other complexities. Determining the entire DNA sequence cannot be done in one long continuous piece. And so we need to find the DNA sequence and then assemble the pieces into a cohesive unit. To handle this complex organization of genomes, NCBI created the assembly database. Later in the webinar, we'll point out the nucleotide records when you need to go to the assembly database. And for the nucleotide database, it follows this general layout that's similar to the other databases that we have at NCBI. On the left, shown in the outline, are the filters or limits or facets. And on the right is the related information or other navigational aid. The search results are shown in the middle section. Nucleotide records have three main sections. And this is a specific nucleotide record. The pink area has the taxonomic, submitter, 
and reference or bibliographic data. The yellow section, shown here in the middle, describes the biological features contained in the sequence. And then the blue section, which we have only a small amount on this record, is the actual sequence data. You can read more about the individual fields in the link shown on the slide. And notice that the abbreviated NCBIUR address, if you know the organism or species for which you want to retrieve sequence data, you can easily structure your search as shown. You can type the complete name of the database field in this case, organism, or abbreviate it as ORGN. And notice that you do not need to put the genus and species names in quotation marks. If you're looking for a specific gene sequence, you can restrict by the title field. Peter will illustrate this in more detail in a few moments. And if you're looking for a specific gene in a specific organism, you can structure the search as shown on the slide. If you want to have a specific gene in a specific organism, you can then structure the search by entering that information and restricting to the title field and then also the organism field. Now Peter is going to do the live web demonstration. Okay, uh, thanks Bonnie and hello everybody. This is Peter Cooper. Uh, and what I'm going to do is attempt to answer these five questions by using the web browser and doing some things at the NCBI site. So we're going to find a particular nucleotide sequence for a gene uh, and for an organism. We're going to talk about what the coding region is and how to get it. We'll talk about how to download sequence data. That's what I mean by extract sequence data, how to get it locally on your machine. We'll look at how to find out what genes have been identified in a particular sequence. And we'll look about how to find out complete genomic sequences um, or complete genomes for a particular organism. So you should be seeing the NCBI homepage, and that's where I'm going to start my searches. And what we're going to do is to work with a particular gene today. The gene that I'm going to work with is adenine phosphoribosyl transferase, at least this will be for about half the webinar. Um, and this is a gene called APRT. Mutations in this gene can cause adenine phosphotransferase deficiency, and which can lead to kidney stones and kidney failure in some cases. So that's just an interesting fact about this gene. It has lots of other useful things when you're doing a demo to its kind of small device. So I'm going to type carefully, because it's a long gene name, phosphoribosyl transferase. Technically, this is not what we're calling the gene name these days. This is basically the name of one of the products of the gene. So that's a reasonable thing to search for if you're trying to find a gene in the nucleotide or protein database. So I'm going to choose nucleotide, and I'm going to run the search. Now we have a lot of records here, and the ones that you can see have the phrase that we searched for in the title. And so that's a pretty useful set of data, and in many cases you might want to have that set. So these are ones that are clearly about this particular gene product or this gene. Um, so I can modify my search so that I'm only searching the title field, and of course most of you probably know how to use the advanced interface in PubMed. So I will do that here. Let me just find this particular phrase in the title word field with a nucleotide database. So as you know, you can always just select this in the index, and there's um, 1,175 records that have that. I can go ahead and run that search. So this is a smaller set of data um, that might be useful to have. By the way, the, the title field in the nucleotide database is actually searching what we call the definition line in the GenBank flat file format. And we'll come back to that in just a moment when we look at the GenBank flat file. So, Let's do one thing here. Let's try to figure out, you know, what were those things that we had a minute ago that did not have adenine phosphoribosyl transferase in the title. And so I'll just use the advanced interface to see what those are. So they obviously had that phrase somewhere else. So let's go to the advanced search again. And we'll go ahead and add my original search to the Boolean builder up here at the top. And I'll add this as a not. Right, so let me edit that. I think if he had, if Peter had either clicked on the number or done a right mouse click. I had to do a right mouse click, which is what I didn't do, right? Problem is I'm used to using a Mac where you have to do a different operation to get that to happen. And we're using a PC, PC for the webinar. Um, 
So what I have, what do I have here? So there are a lot of these things that seem to be um, genomic sequences, like chromosome four from Xenopus tropicalis, um, chromosome eleven from a zebra finch, not a zebra fish, and other kinds of records. So these are probably things that have uh, adenine phosphoribosyl transferase annotated on them somehow, or have that mentioned somewhere in the record. And just for a simple example of that, let me look at this um, sequence from Arabidopsis, just to show you how that works. So we found this record because it has this phrase in lots of different contexts on the record. It's in the keyword section of the record. It's in the title of the article that's cited on the record. And it's also in this thing at the bottom, which is really the meat and potatoes of the biological information that's on the record called the feature table. And then we're going to look at the feature table in more detail in a few minutes. And there it is, their adenine phosphoribosyl transferase. Let's go back um, to our original search where we had the title search. I can get back there easily by going back, or I can simply use the advanced interface to do that. So I'll get back my 1175 records that I have here. So now I want to talk about what kind of records we have in this search. Uh, and we'll notice that there's a couple of ways that these are being separated out into categories. Um, there are these INSTC or GenBank records. These are uh, sequences or records that are submitted to one of the collaborating nucleotide databases, including GenBank, which is at the NIH, uh, the ENA, which is at uh, EBI, and the DNA Database of Japan. These are submitter records. There are also reference sequences here. These are things that are curated by the NCBI staff, and they should be the most complete and up-to-date records that you can find. Those are the ones that you probably want to emphasize if you can find those. We also have them divided up into whether they're genomic sequences, or whether they're transcript sequences, which is labeled here as uh, mRNA. Let's first take a look at some of the INSTC records. So something did not go the way that it did before. What happened here? So I don't know what's going wrong with this particular search, but I think I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the reference sequences to see if I can get those to work for me. So we'll go back. These are the NCBI, potentially NCBI curated reference sequences. There are predicted ones, and there are ones that are curated by us. Um, we can go ahead and add something to the search to make it more useful. Let's go ahead and get the human sequences, and that's what I probably did wrong. I forgot to include that as my yeah, search might have been, yeah. yeah. Okay, so now we're looking at um, NCBI curated reference sequences. Um, and there are um, three different ones here. There are the two transcripts from the uh, APRT gene, and then there is the uh, APRT RefSeq gene record on chromosome 16. This is a standalone genomic record uh, for this particular um, gene in the genome. And there are two transcript variants. Um, we'll look at the second one here. No particular reason for doing that. This happens to be a longer one. So if we look at this record compared to an INSTC record, which I did not actually show you uh, much detail today, although we did see one for that X record we saw earlier for Rabidopsis, you would probably notice that if you compare that to that previous one that there are tons of literature citations on here. These are coming from and in collaboration with the gene database. These are gene references into function. And there are also articles about the sequence. Yes? And I'm going to interject, on a RefSeq record, the default is to have 10 references, mm -hmm. which does look a lot more than what are on typical INSDC records. The default is the five oldest and the five newest. However, RefSeq curators can explicitly mark a reference to show up on the RefSeq record if it's one of those that's not the earliest or not the latest. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that there's a comment on this record that lets you know that this is a review record, so that means it's been human curated. A human being has looked at the data that are going into this record, and they've selected two records from the INSDC, from the GenBank database, or one of the other databases to construct the data that's in this record. Um, and there's also a note about the biology. Go down to the feature table here, and there are a number of useful features. One of the features that um, we talk about, we mentioned, the Bonnie mentioned in the introduction, is the CDS feature. And if I click here, one thing I can do is to highlight this feature in the sequence record itself. 
So we're now looking at the sequence record. And I'll just mention in passing that we talked about this is an mRNA sequence, but notice that we use the DNA alphabet even for mRNA at NCBI, so there's a T there instead of a U. It's not particularly important. It's just sort of a convention that we use. Sometimes people get tripped up by that, but you go by the top of the record where it says that it's an mRNA, and that will tell you to switch that T to a U if you need to. We have the ability to download this if we want to. Notice that we have the coding region, which starts with the start codon, ATG, which is the one that Bonnie showed you in her slideshow a few minutes ago. This has a slightly different stop codon. I think hers had a TAA. This is a TGA, but it also is a nonsense codon, which means that's where the translation stops. We can display this if we want to in FASTA format. This would be a good way to go ahead and download that if I was interested in doing that. Um, I could send this to a file from here, or um, I can go back and get it from the other page. Go back to my search for a minute and show you a couple of other things that I can do. If we're talking about downloading things, you can bulk download sequences if you want to right from the Entree search. So we have three sequences here, very small set. Um, I could have done this with the 1175 that I had uh, originally. Um, but notice that I could download the complete record as a file here. And the most common sequence format that people get because they want to do sequence analysis on these or analyze these locally is FASTA. I could select that and I could create a file and it would download it for me. If I want to see what FASTA format looks like, um, I can go over here to the display options and change this. If I change it to FASTA like this, it will still be displayed as a web page. If you change it to FASTA text, you're going to get essentially exactly what you would get in that downloaded file. So this is what FASTA format looks like. You have those two transcript sequences plus the rest of the gene record at the bottom. This is a little bit cleaner of a format to use because you have less editing out of unnecessary information when you're going to use the data in a different program. Right, and, and also the most of the programs that read FASTA understand that that first line, although it's wrapped in the web browser, it begins with a greater than sign which is over here on the right-hand side, left-hand side, sorry, got the right, left confusion there. Um, that's treated as a, the program knows that that's not um, part of the data. Okay. Now, I was planning to show you the um, coding region feature on a genomic sequence on a GenBank record, but that doesn't matter. I can show it to you on the rest of the gene record. Let me go ahead and load this one. So I'm down in the feature table here. And there are several genes on this record, so there's more than one here. So I can load any one I want to. One that I want to load, of course, is APRT, which is right here. But let me show you what happens with the coding region here. So notice that you'll see these join statements. That's because this is a genomic sequence from humans, so we're going to have exons and introns. These are the coding exons of this particular gene. Let me go ahead and highlight this for you. Same device we saw a minute ago that highlights the um, CDS feature in this record. So if we wanted to download this, again, I could click FASTA. What I'm going to get is the join of these different sequence segments here uh, as a single FASTA file. Okay, so these are three different kinds of um, reference sequences that represent aspects of the human genome. Let me go and get the other kind that we haven't seen yet, and that's the human genome chromosome sequence. So I'm going to take the title restriction out of this search, and I'm going to search um, this way, and we'll see what happens. And we still have our reference sequence limit over here on the left-hand side. Notice I picked up a few more records. And you'll recognize some of these as other RefSeq gene records, and I should have pointed this out a minute ago, but let me just remind you, um, if you don't know, you can always recognize a reference sequence at NCBI because it has a particular kind of accession number. It will have a prefix, um, two letters, followed by an underscore. So there's a typical kind of accession number for a RefSeq gene record. This one, the NC, is a typical kind of RefSeq accession number for a chromosome record. And then the ones at the top, the transcript sequences that we've already looked at, is a typical kind of RefSeq accession number for a transcript sequence. Sometimes in a paper, you'll see that the underscore has been dropped. That's an error. There should always be an underscore in a RefSeq accession number. 
All right, so let's go ahead and retrieve one of these large chromosome records, and they're the ones that we didn't get before. We didn't get them in the title word search because the gene is on this chromosome, but there are also more than a thousand other genes on this chromosome. Um, so we couldn't put all that in the title. I'm going to go ahead and retrieve chromosome 16. And notice when I do that, I get an abbreviated view of the record. So just to show you what happens, I've got sort of the header area with all the citations and things like that, some information about the sequence. But there is no sequence here because the sequence is over 90 million bases long. This is kind of a laborious to load into your web browser. Not only that, but the annotation, the genes and the mRNAs and the coding regions, they take up a lot of room, too, and so we don't show them to you by default. Um, notice it tells you about that here. It says display features. You can do that. You can also use this customized view over here to do that. So I could do it this way. And notice that I could potentially show the sequence if I want to. I don't know why you would want to load all of chromosome 16 into a web browser. Um, people do try to do that, but I don't recommend it. Even this will take about... 30 or 40 seconds to download. So because of that, so if I click on this, it's going to try to download those. It will give me this message saying it's trying to download this big thing. So I decided to save a little time, and I already preloaded this for us with the genes and the other features on it. So notice you can see the feature table here, which is a big record, but it has lots of features, coding regions, genes, and so on and so forth. So for example, Let's find the adenine phosphoribosyl transferase gene in this record. And Peter is just doing a find within yeah, the page. Yeah, that's doing, just doing the finding page, which is obviously not the best way to do this, but I just wanted to show you that you can get down here into the feature table and you can find the gene feature. You can find the messenger RNAs that are aligned to make that gene feature and things like that. Now, one thing that you might want to know if you're looking at a record like this, to kind of depart for a minute from the idea of looking at a single gene, what if you wanted to know what all the genes are on this record? Of course, I could do a find and page and count the number of these little gene tags in the feature table. Um, that's probably not a good way to do that. But a better way to do that is on the right-hand side. Which is where the related information is. And there should be a link to gene. So the scroll bar on the mouse does not work very well. So I could click the gene. Now I'm going to open that in a new tab because I don't want to have to load this chromosome 16 record again. And if somebody asks you the question, how many genes are annotated on chromosome 16 by NCBI, this would be the way to answer that question. There's 1,917 of them. So we've left nucleotide for a moment, and we've gone into the gene database. Let's go back and find our gene again. Now that I know, and I should have pointed it out to you, what the gene is called, I can find it a little bit easier by, so we have APRT here. And of course, I can do exactly the same thing I did to load the gene before. I just want to do that in a slightly different way to point something out to you. Click on this to highlight the gene. And instead of displaying FASTA, let's display GenBank this time. So really, all that that widget does for you, or the device, or whatever you want to call that little um, shortcut that we have there, it just loads the appropriate region of this chromosome sequence for you. And it gives you a nice little view of that region of the human genome that's annotated for this gene. And so we have the gene itself, and then we have two different transcripts annotated or aligned to the gene. Here they are here, the two mRNAs, and they have two different coding regions on them. So this is a genomic record, but as I said, you can get multiple mRNA transcripts from a single DNA molecule. And so we're going to annotate on the genomic record both of those mRNAs and both of those protein products for this particular gene on the human chromosome 16. Now, obviously, browsing the flat file for looking at genes is not particularly fun or a very good way to do this. So I just want to show you another way of looking at a complex record like this. And that's the graphics view. And that's a very useful way if you actually want to browse the chromosome or some other large complicated sequence use the graphics view. So I'm going to open that in a new tab. And now we have sort of an overview of chromosome 16. This panel up here sort of gives you a broad view of it. This is a more detailed view down here. And there are several tracks. Those tracks essentially are kind of the features that are present on that chromosome record. It's a way of sort of seeing them in a graphical way. But it's more um, dynamic than that. And you have the ability to access different properties of those objects in this viewer. 
A real simple thing we're going to do here um, is we're going to search and find APRT. If I just go to the magnifying glass and click on it, I can just type that feature in, and it found it. If I double click on it, it's going to load that for me, and it's highlighted it for me to let me know that there it is, and there I can see sort of a com combination of the uh, two uh, messenger RNAs representing this gene here. Yes. And if you notice in the upper part, you now have the yellow square. So this APRT gene is near the end of chromosome 16. When we first came into this view, we had the whole display, but we did not have that yellow bar, that yellow square to tell us where we were on the chromosome. But now that we've searched for that particular gene, we've now moved down to that particular part of the chromosome. Now, the other thing you can do is zoom out if you want to see what genes are in the region to the thing that to, I want to, to get see. to the neighboring yeah. genes. Yeah. And so you can rec you may remember um, the CDT1 gene was one of the RefSeq gene records. Notice that they're aligned down here. That's the uh, RefSeq gene record for the CDT1 gene. Notice that it overlaps and contains part of the APRT gene, and that's why we found it in our original search. Likewise, the record that's downstream, really upstream from uh, APRT, is the GALNS gene, and that also contains parts of the APRT gene. So one thing I wanted to show you before we leave the topic of reference sequences, I just want to show you one quick shortcut. You might say to me, why didn't you show me this? beginning because it makes life a lot easier in some cases. If I'm really just interested in the reference sequences and I know the gene symbol like there, when I do that kind of a search, um, it loads for me something called the gene sensor. I can ignore these results down here and I have links to the RefSeq gene record, the two transcripts, and even in a different database, the protein sequences. Let's say we saw a complete, we did see a complete chromosome from the human genome. Suppose somebody said to you, you know, I want to download the human genome, the complete genome. How could I do that in the nucleotide database? This is kind of a trick question because the answer to that is that you really can't do that. So let's just do a naive search here. So I can search for a complete genome. Let's just do that and see what happens. Sometimes you just have to do trial and error. I'm going to take this RefSeq filter off. So you might think that this actually did something that I intended to do. So I can see that I do have a bunch of human sequences there. I also see that I have a bunch of mycobacterium or other bacterial things here. These are bacterial genomes. Um, and if you think about what I just did, you'll realize that what I must be seeing are single molecule genomes to a certain extent. So typically bacteria have a central chromosome, one, and these human records happen to be mitochondrial sequences. So this is, I'm just going to show you this real quick. If I just add human to this, and I'm going to use the abbreviation Bonnie showed you earlier. What are these things? These are mitochondrial genomes. So they're single molecule genomes. So you could, of course, get these if you want to and download stuff. I just, I think I neglected to show you something because I got tripped up in this. Let me show you this real quickly because I want to make sure that you know that you can download all of the coding regions and gene features to the SEN menu. And I didn't just point that out to you. I think I meant to before. So notice that I can pick those and download those. And if I want to, I'll get all the coding regions on this particular chromosome record. This is the mitochondrial genome. Um, I could have done the same thing, by the way, for chromosome 16. So this is not the way to do this. And the answer is you need to use a different database to do this. And that database is the database that Bonnie mentioned, and that's called assembly. So if I'm really interested in downloading all of the records that constitute the human genome, I need to go to the assembly database. We're back looking at the chromosome 16 record uh, in the nucleotide database. So what I want to do is to link to assembly. So now I have a, this is sort of the summary view of this record. I could download this if I want to right now. It would take me to the FTP site and it would get me the entire file that I wanted. I can select here from whatever type of file I want. If I want to get proteins or genomic or anything like that, I can do it from here. If I click through to the record, it contains and collects for me all of the nucleotide sequences that constitute the chromosomes of the human genome. Clicking on any one of these links will take me back into the nucleotide database, and I'll be looking at, say, for example, chromosome 16 like we did a minute ago. So this would be a really good example of a 
fairly complete genome. It's not absolutely complete because there are still regions that we don't know what the sequence is. Um, there are other genomes that are less complete than this, and I just want to show you how you access the sequence data for those. Because many people will come to you and say, for example, I want to find the complete genome of this particular organism. The first place you would need to go is assembly, and then you need to figure out how complete it is it, and is this what the person's looking for. And it's possible to have a complete genome that's not assembled very well, and that's what we're going to look at here in a minute. I'm going to type the name of an organism. This is a spider, a famous spider, brown recluse. So that's a poisonous spider. Most people have heard of that one. And here we have an assembly. And unlike, of course, I can go to the FTP site just like I could before to download the GenBank assembly. There is no RefSeq assembly for this one. At the bottom of the record, though, it tells me that it doesn't have any assembled chromosomes. So how could I get the data for this if I wanted to look at the individual sequences? Uh, I can go here. This is a kind of a funny-looking um, link. It says WGS Master. This is an example of what's called a whole genome shotgun sequence or a WGS sequence. These are basically barely assembled pieces of a genome. They're not attached to or mapped to any chromosomes or larger units in the genome. They're just the sequences that they could fit together. Sometimes there are thousands of these that constitute the genome, and we don't really know how they fit together. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. Still, many people want to get those sequences. If you go to the WGS master link, this is a peculiar kind of record in the nucleotide database. It doesn't contain any sequence data. In fact, at the top, where normally the length of the sequence is shown, there's a record count. Um, so this particular whole genome shotgun, or WGS assembly, uh, contains um, 1.3 million records. Because of the very large numbers of individual sequences that co constitute one of these kinds of uh, genome assemblies, we don't store them in the nucleotide database. If somebody actually wants to get access to those sequences, they could use the assembly database and download them from the FTP site, or they can link to a different um, resource at NCBI. It's called the uh, um, WGS browser, and I'm just going to follow that link. Or me, sequence set browser. Yeah, it's, it's also called the sequence set browser because it does contain some other kinds of sequences. Let me just back up for a minute because I did that quickly. Just, what I'm doing basically is following the link these accession numbers at the bottom. There are scaffolds in this assembly. Those are slightly larger assemblies of the contigs, which are the smaller pieces. Neither one of these things is terribly um, highly assembled. So I'm now in the sequence set browser. If I actually want to download the contigs or look at them, I can get them here, display them in FASTA format, for example. This is one at a time, not particularly useful. Um, Scaffolds are a little bigger. They have a lot of ends in them. If you want to take a look at these yourself, I won't bother you to load one of them. Probably what a person would want to do is to download this whole set. So you can do that from here if you want, or of course you can do it from the assembly database. And Peter, if you go back to the nucleotide record for this, I want you to go up to the top of the page and point out something. Oh, we're right here. So notice that the keyword says WGS. That's going to tell you that this is that kind of a record, along with what the, Peter said earlier, the RC. But also notice that the accession has four letters and then a string of numbers. Anytime you see that kind of an accession, that is going to be a draft genome or a WGS type of group of records. Okay, so that is the demo. So I'm going to turn this back over to Bonnie. So these are the questions that we answered in the webinar. And as I said at the beginning, some of these questions flowed into another, and we used the same database record to answer more than one question. We wanted to discuss the complete genome type of a question and in my mind, I'm putting that phrase in quotation marks because this is a common question that we receive and that you might receive, yet what is meant by the phrase complete genome that can mean different things to different people. What is complete depends on what data are available. 
Someone might say they want the complete genome, but they will accept draft or WGS because that is all that is available at the present time. We've created some extra questions for you to practice on your own. They are in this web directory. We didn't provide the answers for you. If you do have any questions about those questions, then you can send email to info at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel. Select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.